دکتر شرمل ندیم من موالید العراق دور سنة 2000 المشنشرية University Medical College Consultant Psychiatrist from British جميل كلية الأطباء الملكية البريطانية Master in Psychology from Manchester University He had the Shahadat Uriya in Tadrib Al-Tabib in Jamaat Ajlum مشرف على طلبة الاختصاص ومتحن في الكلية الملكية وكليات الطب والمجلس الطبي لمعاهدة الشهادات مسؤولة بالعاية الطبية في ثلاث مدن روشيل بيري أورتهام مشارك بالعديد من المشاريع والبحوث في المؤتمرات العالمية حائز على شهادات تقديرية وإنجاز العديد من المشاريع التي ساهمت في تطوير النظام الصحي في المملكة المتحدة. دكتور سلمى الغني عن التعريف Now we are listening to Dr. Sarvet with his lecture, Depression in Adults with Chronic Physical Health Problems, Recognition and Management. Thank you very much, Dr. Ahmed. It's uh, lovely to be here today. Um, after our uh, meeting in May, um, I'm very privileged for Yuma to uh, focus on mental health disorders. and. Two hours. Twenty minutes. Twenty. Twenty minutes. Twenty minutes. We usually psychiatrists take an hour for that. Anyway, so it's it's great to be here today, and big thanks to Dr. Rafid and the committee, and the UMA, focusing on mental health disorders. And very um, excited to see the medical students, trainees, uh, Nassimi did a fantastic job. Well done, very impressive. So, after a discussion that I had with Dr. Rafat about what we're going to focus on, I thought it would be really helpful to have a discussion about depression and chronic health conditions. All of you guys dealing with chronic health conditions, or possibly some of us do have chronic health conditions. So, focusing on depression in these conditions will be really helpful and also raise the awareness of how we can manage it, how we deal with it. So that's today's overview. We're just going to talk about how we can diagnose depression, how we can detect it, and how patients present, how we're going to manage it in different settings. So mental disorders in general, it's prevalent. We are talking about millions and millions of people, 5% of the adult population of the world do suffer from depression. Staggering figure, 280 million people suffer from depression worldwide in adults. And this depression will lead to suicide. We are looking at 800,000 of suicide deaths a year. And I think that is um, a figure that will go above that because of un um, recognized cases and, and recorded cases of suicide in the third world. The problem with depression, it's undiagnosed. It goes undiagnosed, untreated. 75% of cases of depression worldwide, it's not treated and, and, and not even diagnosed. It's very common in, in female compared to men. Talking about chronic health conditions and how depression manifests in chronic health conditions, two to three times more common in chronic health conditions. So we're talking about high prevalence in chronic health conditions. Just look at the figures there. Cancer patients, post-MI, post-stroke, all these patients. You are managing GPs, surgeons, physicians, A&E, all specialties, the obstetricians. They're all downstairs, no, no obstetricians here now. <laughs> So uh, we are talking about high prevalence, and if you look at the figures and the, and the data, it's really worrying to know that our patients, that number, uh, with these conditions, they do have depression. So how does, it, how does it start? What causes depression? As you know, depression is multifactorial. There is the biochemical changes, there is the neuroendocrine changes, genetic plays a part, psychodynamic, and that's why the way we really need to understand depression is by having what we call a biopsychosocial approach. 
It's not only focusing on the psychology of the patient, it's thinking about the person as a whole. What happens in depression and why we end up with physical changes in depression and why it affects the body? This is what happens. There is a sympathetic nervous system activation. There is HPA axis hyperactivity, which will, all the stress hormones will increase. It will result in insulin resistance. With insulin resistance, we can have diabetes, cardiovascular changes. And then we end up in this vicious circle. This vicious circle of the biological links that we just touched on, in addition to that, the impact of these changes on our body. If I'm stressed, not motivated, I'm not going to be able to look for a job, I'm not going to reach out for my medications, I'm not going to engage with my GP, I'm not going to go for my checks. So we end up with a vicious cycle of physical and mental health. And that's where it becomes a vicious circle of ongoing problems of depression, and physical, and also social problems. So the patients will end up with a lifestyle of obesity, smoking, and no physical activity. So all the things that you do guys in your clinic, when you tell them you need to look after yourself, you need to exercise, you need to walk, all the healthy living style advices that you're gonna give them, they don't have the motivation to do it. And no wonder why their mental health and physical health will deteriorate and they don't respond to treatment. This is the visual circle that we're talking about. Just keep in mind, someone with depression, hopelessness, helplessness, lacking of motivation, no interest, they think that they are not even important to go to the GP, not important to go to the psychiatrist. I'm not going to take my medication. So they are tired, exhausted, no concentration, and that is the mindset of someone who is depressed. And when we don't pick this up in your practice, if you are seeing them for a chronic health condition, you start wondering why, where, what is the problem? Why this patient is not responding to the treatment that I'm giving them? So when we combine depression with chronic health condition, this is the result. Mortality will increase, suicide will increase, the quality of life will be much worse if it's only depression or a chronic health condition. Very low adherence to treatment. They're not compliant. And I'll show you in one of the slides how they don't take their medications. They will not take it. They will forget. They don't have the concentration to do that. This is very interesting, the increased medical symptoms burden. So for example, you, you, you check them, you see them in your clinic, and the symptoms are very exaggerated. And obviously the medical cause. So why depression is underdiagnosed? The thinking about it, that when you see them in your clinics with a chronic health condition, some of the symptoms, they overlap with depression. They're going to tell you that I'm tired. They're going to tell you that I don't have energy, I don't sleep. And you attribute some of the symptoms to the to the chronic health condition. That's one of the reasons. Sometimes also people will recognize and finish and will think, yeah, you will be low in mood, you will not be happy because you have a chronic health condition. So that we attribute that to the chronic health condition and the reaction rather than depression. And obviously there are concerns about antidepressants. That is the graph when it shows the how non-compliant your patients with their medications if they are depressed. A lot of your patients and the risks, for example, with cardiovascular disease, 90% of it's modifiable risk factors, isn't it? Smoking, weight, exercise, diet, take your medications, and so on. But if someone who's not non-compliant, what is going to happen? They don't have the energy to do that. So they're not going to engage with it. They're not going to engage with your advice. So they forget to take their medications or skip the dose or they don't take it. So what's the link? How is, how is the link when it comes to the mental health and the background? This is one of the biggest studies in the United States. It's called the ACE, Adverse Childhood 
experiences. What they found, they found after studying thousands and thousands of adults, what happens in your childhood, what happens to you, will have a massive impact on you when you are an adult. So, if there is an abuse, neglect, or family circumstances, which you can see, it will increase your risks of developing COPD, heart disease, cancer. So, in addition to other factors that contribute to development of mental disorders and physical health disorders, trauma and the ACE study uh, proved that. If you look at these figures, the more trauma you have, the more trauma you have, the dose of the trauma will increase your likelihood of developing heart disease, asthma, diabetes. And it will be really interesting in your practice, guys, that just ask about your, the background, ask about the childhood, ask about trauma, what happened to them? What happened to them? That is the key question. And then you start looking at your patients, your caseload, how many of them really struggled with trauma and what happened to them led, led to the chronic health the condition that they're dealing with. And again, more figures to show you the ACE study and how it increases these risks. So this is showing the bi-directional interaction, bi-directional interaction between the chronic health condition and the depression. So looking at the genetic vulnerability, looking at the trauma, what happened to them, childhood adversities. These childhood adversities, what it does to us, it will cause maladaptive attachment. It will affect the way that we think. It will affect the way that we behave. It will affect the way that we feel. So it affects our personalities. So it will affect the way that we perceive health system, health givers, care. And what will that result in? Depression and anxiety. And then we end up in this vicious circle. So when do you suspect it? In your practice, acute hospital, GP practice, outpatient clinics, when do you suspect it? Always have a low threshold to think whether this patient do suffer from a mental disorder. Physical symptoms are severe, disabling, and there is something more into it. When you start thinking about why this patient is not responding to the treatment. And their function is poorer than expected. You would expect with that back pain, possibly you would recover in a week or two weeks and start doing this and that, but they are not. Start thinking about it. Polypharmacy, I'm happy about the healthcare, there's a lot of anger, whether to the GP, whether to the psychiatrist, whether to the clinic, there's a lot of anger. And you start questioning whether they have an underlying depression. So how do we treat it? This is just an overview of how we treat depression. The most important thing is detection, thinking about, keep it in your mind. Because of how common it is, think about depression that it can be. So it can, this could be depression, so detect it. The most important thing that I focus on in my practice, and I'm one of the psychiatrists that I don't like to prescribe a lot of medications, I focus on self-management, self-help, and psychosocial interventions rather than just medications. And obviously the practice here in the UK gives me that you know, freedom and independency to, without the influence of you know, just focusing on, and obviously the availability of psychological services and the availability of therapy that we have. So the patients come to my clinic and they are expecting medications, they want medications, they ask for it. But you try and engage with them and explain to them that sometimes the medication is not the answer. Obviously psychological medicine services, an integrated service. Use rating scales, anyone can use it in their practice. Rating scales are very useful, it gives you the idea about how depressed the patient is. And in terms of the symptoms of depression, this is how you think about the symptoms of depression. This is ICD-10, International Classification of uh, Diseases. ICD-10, it gives you an idea about the three core features of depression. Low mood, 
and hedonia, energia, in addition to that, the additional symptoms. And that's how we classify someone who is mild, moderate, severely depressed. So it's not like I can, yeah, they come to my clinic and they have low mood and they are depressed. They have to have a, a diagnostic criteria. <coughs> Always ask these clinic questions. Very simple. <coughs> National Institute of Clinical Excellence, NICE guidelines will ask you guys just to use that in your practice in any setting with your patients. Just these simple questions. <coughs> and then it will allow you to have a, a feel whether they have depression or not. Management and how to manage patients, it's so important to have that sense of exploration. Someone who just diagnosed them with cancer, someone who just diagnosed them with epilepsy, someone you're going to do a major operation for. Understand what they feel and how they feel and what this condition means to them and the impact of this condition. For example, HGV driver, when they have an MI, that's it, they can't drive after that. And that is a life-changing illness, isn't it? Or epilepsy, for example, and so on. So always engage, try to understand how they think about and how they feel about their condition. In terms of management of depression, this is what NICE guidelines will suggest. Focusing on guided self-help, especially for the less severe depression, not the severe one that we tend to deal with in, in hospital and secondary care. A lot of focus on cognitive behavioral therapy, psychological therapy, groups, activation, behavioral activation, and this is what we try to promote, which is, by the way, this is not only for our, for our depressed patient, this is for all of us. It's like a prophylaxis, how we can prevent ourselves from developing depression. And for patients who are more depressed and severely depressed, this is how we manage them by then starting medications, focusing on alternative therapies. And there is a clear guidance that you can refer to with nice guidance about how to start, but you can see from the less severe depression, assessment, psychoeducation, and then gradually, obviously, secondary care, ECT, and uh, hospital admissions and other alternative treatments. This is one of the pioneering uh, therapies that we have now. I'm very pleased that in my trust that we managed to secure this in the NHS. This is the first clinic that we've delivered in the NHS in the Northwest. Transmagnetic stimulation for treatment resistant of depression. This is a new and innovative therapy for stimulation of the brain through magnetic stimulation, giving magnetic pulses and it is showing fantastic results, and this is available through the NHS. What about medications? We have a lot of studies that will tell us what kind of medications that we use, their efficacy, and their acceptability. And we have a list of medications. Obviously, we're not going to go through all of them today, but just to give you an idea about the antidepressants that we have. This table will show you the range of side effects and how important you think about the side effects of medications on your patients. So what do we start? Let's think about medications. First line treatment. If you are clear that this patient is suffering from depression, you excluded all other conditions that might present the same way. You've done the bloods, so you're clear about this is the patient is presenting with depression, start with first line treatment. NICE guidelines will suggest and support SSRIs, but the problem with SSRIs, we're talking about chronic health conditions, if they have hyponitremia, if they are high risk of bleeding, or this lady who just had a, a stroke, obviously you need to think about the risk of increasing, uh, a risk of increased bleeding risk, and that's when you start balancing the risk depending on the chronic health condition that you're dealing with. I guess after the second line you will start thinking, I just need to refer this patient to a psychiatrist because now we're struggling to think about what would be next. Having said that, some of our brilliant GPs, uh, they are doing a fantastic job doing first line, second line, because of the lack of resources depending on the area they work in. So consider the following. Always think about mental health disorders. Also think about side effects of antidepressants. 
think about there's no particular medication that you I would tell you use that in particular. It's all case by case because this case might have diabetes, but in the same time, for example, they are at high risk of bleeding, then you would not choose um, an SSRI for them and so on. It's all dependent on the case by case. But there's plenty of evidence to suggest that. Depression and diabetes, it's very common and also uh, it has a direct effect. Even the, the more that you are treating your depression better, your blood sugar will improve. And obviously pain, one of the most difficult, challenging cases for managing pain is in GP practices and also in secondary care with integrated pain service. More guidelines now that we have that we not only managing with painkillers, we need integrated pain service. And again, in our trust, we established a new service that we work together as a team to manage the chronic pain. And that's, we talked about this, when to refer. Obviously, when it's a challenging case, risks, psychosis, self leg, cognitive impairment, rapid deterioration, always think this is beyond moderate depression that I can manage in my practice. I need to refer to a psychiatrist. So the key messages. How am I doing with time? Six minutes. Oh, really? Right. No, right. So, five minutes? Okay. Four, four. <laughs> so the key messages. The key messages is mental health disorders are very common. Suspect it. Think about it. The mental disorders, they will have a massive impact on what you are treating your patients with. Just keep that in mind. Your patients, whether you're treating them for a cardiac condition, a surgical operation, physician, any, if they have depression or they have an anxiety or they have a mental disorder, think they will die five to ten years earlier than the general population. If I have depression, I will die five to ten years earlier. If I have bipolar or schizophrenia, I will die 15 to 20 years earlier. Just think about this. So the mortality rate is increasing. Morbidity is increasing. Comorbidity is obviously. Suicide is increasing with patients with depression and chronic health conditions. Obviously, we talked about the genetic predisposition. We said that definitely the case. Trauma, always keep in mind what happened to them. And we cover that with how the um, impact of chronic health condition and depression. So the message is, think about depression, think about anxiety, think about mental disorders. Always try your best to engage with your local mental health services. Having an established clinic. When I worked in North Manchester with a, the, the diabetes surgeon at uh, the diabetes clinic with the uh, as a liaison psychiatrist. I worked with the oncologist when they were treating patients for cancer. I was seeing their patients in ICU. I would go and see patients presenting with uh, delirium, acute confusional states, psychosis, um, encephalitis, and so on. So try and think about your partnership with your local psychiatrist. Integrated pain service is a must thinking about pain management in that approach rather than just trying and think about medications. So I think I'm okay with time and we're okay to take questions. Thank you. Thank you for a nice interesting lecture. I have a question. Yes. Uh, I want to ask about the TMS. Yes. Trans magnetic stimulation. stimulation. Yes. It has a bright, as you say, a bright future. Yes. What is the mode of action of this maneuver or tool, I think, or yes. instrument? So, I'm yes. sorry. Uh, I, let me complete my question. Yes. And the second, uh, uh, how long it's used in fibromyalgia syndrome? Brilliant, really good questions. So TMS, uh, with the transmagnetic stimulation, we have an electrode 
that will pick up the area of the brain, depending on the impedance that we have, and how the side of the brain that we will stimulate, we will choose a dose. The patient is awake, like the lady that we showed in this slide. This is our clinic. Patients will be awake, will be reading their magazine, book, going through their iPad. They will have a daily sessions, a daily sessions for three weeks. And the response and if they will their response rate will be measured. We have a screening tools before and baseline tests how uh, they are progressing through the treatment. In terms of the side effects, it's generally well toler tolerated. It can cause lightheadedness, it can cause a bit of tinnitus, and it's generally well tolerated. It's not like ECT that everyone knows about, but this is the new treatment that it will stimulate using the transmagnetic stimulation for certain areas of the brain. Obviously, these, when we use the medications, we try and stimulate these areas of the brain through using antidepressants. But with the transmagnetic stimulation, we're targeting the areas of the brain that we suspect that will have a better influence on the patient's mood. There is clear evidence when it comes to depression. Now there is growing evidence uh, treating um, anxieties. In terms of the fibromyalgia, when you think about fibromyalgia, how much of it is mental health related? And how much symptoms of mental health that they present with? And how, whether they are depressed or not? I don't have, and I don't think that there is clear evidence yet for, and it's not licensed, to use it in patients purely for fibromyalgia. But if there is comorbid depressions, definitely that would be indicated. And especially in cases of fibromyalgia, the higher rate of depression is there. So if they are depressed, definitely they would be a, uh, a candidate for TMS. How many sessions do you think So what we did, daily sessions for up to three weeks, and there is the intense session, an intense therapy that we can give longer sessions, uh, but it will be shorter. So the patients will come to the outpatient, they drive to the clinic, and they drive back. They don't need to uh, stay in hospital. So uh, daily sessions for up to three weeks. Thank you. Thank you. And it's available in the NHS in certain areas that uh, depend on where you practice. But in the Northwest, our TMS is available for all Northwest patients. So Manchester and the area available. Dr. Powell. Yes, Dr. Thank you very much for your advice. Pleasure. Pleasure. Uh, just I want to ask you yes. to add some point. Yes. According to WHO's expectation, in the coming one to three decades of life, depression will be the leading cause of death in the whole world. Absolutely. And suicide yes. is most, probably will be number one cause of death in the world. Is sure. right or there is something not a key? This is expectation. This is absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And this is the pandemic that we're dealing with and the endemic that we are dealing with. Increase the mental disorders, depression. We all seeing the impact of stress of life, increase in the pressures of life, depression is rising. So it will be a leading cause. Now it's the second leading cause of disability worldwide. So in, in the future it will be. My second point is that the advancement is technology and the yes. communication, the yes. Instagram, the Facebook, all this is accelerating and isolating people in the home and houses. You go to your family, you each one, without talking to you, take out and ask you about the Wi-Fi and yeah, connect, yeah. connect you to the Wi-Fi. No one speak with others. Absolutely. Of mine in Baghdad, yeah. he told me a story, a very nice story in University of Baghdad. He said, yeah. one of the doctors or uh, students actually in the medical college, talking to his friend in the college that yesterday at night, he meet a lot of nice people speaking <laughs> and gathering together, eating together. They asked me, where are you? Okay, they said that there is no electricity. So I meet <laughs> with my father. For the first time we met. For the first time. For the first time. Absolutely. So isolation and this new technology probably accelerate the depression rate and does. 100%. Thank you, Prof. And the use of social media is a double-edged sword. Um, using it like we're using it here to get together, generate the awareness, engage with people. But the other way around, it increases the isolation. It's affecting the way that people communicate. I had a patient who was admitted to the hospital, to the mental health unit, because his internet was interrupted. 
he reached a stage of you know severe uh, distress because of and suicidal because he was unable to play his video games and be online. So you're absolutely right. Okay, uh, last question, Dr. Uh, thank you so much for this nice uh, presentation. Just my question is uh, about the grief. It is apart from depression, about the difference between grief and depression or the treatment. Absolutely. Yes. So this is a brilliant question, Dr. Amr. Grief by itself, when we talk about grief, when we lose someone, yes, so bereavement, and sometimes the, the grief is this. Imagine that I'm diagnosed with a, a terminal diagnosis for epilepsy, the grief and the adjustment and the loss of my job, the loss of my colleagues. So this is grieving process. The grief is di different from depression. The way that we treat it is completely different. The way that we understand it is different. Medications, sometimes we use it at a later stage. The focus is understanding, more making sure that the right diagnosis, right assessment, support, psychological therapy, and it is different from depression. Can they develop depression? Very high risk of depression, definitely. It is a time for more than six months or something like that? To be honest, it depends on the case. So for example, abnormal grief reaction, abnormal grief reaction, if it's an acute stress reaction, again, that is immediate within a few weeks, abnormal grief reaction after 12 months, we start suspecting if someone who's not adjusting to the loss of the person or the death of someone, after 12 months we start talking about abnormal grief reaction, or sometimes within six months, if their symptoms will be called morbid with depression, then you will start thinking that we need to do more than deal with it as a, a normal grief reaction. There's one more question from Nassim, and he's our medical student. Yeah, exactly. All right. So okay. Uh, you mentioned uh, about adherence. So we did the study in fourth year uh, about me medication adherence. We went to patients to see which of the factors that were studied would affect mostly uh, about the patient taking their medications. So we took examined gender, age groups, illnesses. They were mostly hypertensive and type two diabetics. Uh, educational levels uh, and quality pharmacy. Uh, interestingly, the only two uh, things that were significant they were the mental state uh, of the patient, so if they were like diagnosed with a, a mental illness or not. And the other thing which is uh, that we can work on is the belief of the patient. So in Iraq, we mostly uh, lack in that department, so we don't uh, communicate with our patients uh, properly. So. If we can educate the patients, if we make them believe that this medication will work, this would be uh, very much helpful with Absolutely. their medication adherence and therefore helpful well with everything. Well done. Amazing Thank study. You. Thank, you. Thank you very much. 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 Thank you very much.